following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Welcome. Today's lecture will delve into the symbolic mysteries of the Gnostic tradition, which encompasses the root knowledge of all the world's religions. By Gnostic, we always indicate a type of understanding that arrives not through the intellect or through something written, but instead that comes through the consciousness, something that we discover through our conscious experience. Therefore, this type of Gnostic understanding is the very heart and root of all the world's religions. And in this way, when we approach the study of religion and mysticism with this point of view of conscious knowledge, we can penetrate the meaning of any religious symbol. Today, we will look at the famous Ark of the Covenant. Anyone who has heard of or has participated in Christianity or Judaism knows about the Ark. And most would say that there are two Arks. But in fact, when we examine even just the scriptural evidence, we discover that there are not two Arks. Even if we study only the literal meaning of the scripture, we find that there are many more arcs in the Bible, in the Midrash, in the Talmud. In the Bible alone, there are at least four arcs. <clears throat> if we were relying on the Latin and later translations of the Bible. But in fact, if we look into the actual scripture, the Hebrew language, we discover there is no ark. The word ark does not appear in Hebrew, ever. It's a Latin word. So this is something that we need to comprehend, to understand that this idea that we have inherited of a literal ark, be it a boat or a box, is in fact just a myth, and the real meaning is far more important and far more mysterious. When we look into the Hebrew scriptures, we discover that the first time this ark is mentioned is in relation with Noah in Latin, but in Hebrew it doesn't say ark, it says ship or boat. 
The next time the Latin mentions an ark is related to Moses. When the princess, the Egyptian princess, sees the baby amongst the reeds in the river, that baby is said to be floating in an ark in Latin. But in Hebrew, it doesn't say ark, it says ship or boat. The next time the word ark appears in Latin, if we refer to the Hebrew, we discover it's related with Moses again. When God tells him, if the people want to receive my teaching, let them build an ark. And this also, in Hebrew, does not say ark. It says aron, which in English letters we would spell A-R-O-N. But in Hebrew, it's spelled aleph, resh, vav, nun. Aleph, resh, vav, nun. Aron. This doesn't say ark. It's a very mysterious thing that from the Hebrew to the Latin, the Hebrew words for ship and aron are both translated as ark. Very mysterious, very interesting. And yet, when you investigate with your consciousness, why? It actually makes sense. There is a relationship between that boat that Noah made and the boat that Moses was found in and the box that Moses made. There is a relationship, but it's a very deep one. This word Aaron in Hebrew seems similar to Aaron, but it is spelled differently. Aaron, the Hebrew word, actually means a chest, a box, a sanctuary. Something to hold something. It comes from an ancient Hebrew root, which is ara, which means to gather or pluck, to accumulate. And this is important because the first time the word aron appears in the Bible is in the book of Exodus, or Shemot, where Hashem, the Lord, says to Moses, Speak unto the children of Israel that they take for me an offering of every man whose heart maketh him willing. Ye shall take my offering and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And there I will meet with thee and I will speak with thee from above the ark cover, the Aaron cover, from between the two cherubim which are on the Aaron of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So this root word, ara, which means to gather, is related with this sacrifice, the offering that the children of Israel must make. This is where we get the word aron. This is the place to hold that sacrifice or offering. The place where that offering comes from is held, and in return, God appears. This is very significant. But the real meaning of it will be elusive if we take it literally. As I mentioned, gnosis is a conscious knowledge that seeks to penetrate the actual meaning, or to be more explicit, the meanings because every symbol has multiple levels of significance. There is the literal meaning. There was a physical item or artifact called the Ark of the Covenant or the Aron of the Testimony. Such a 
device or artifact existed. Nonetheless, the literal meaning doesn't concern us. Whether this physical thing still exists or not is irrelevant. What we need is knowledge that will help transform our life now. Not knowledge of an ancient possibility, but knowledge of a possibility in this moment. From this point of view, we need to look at the story or the symbol of the Ark in relation to its significance for us. And in this level, we know that Moshe, or Moses, represents an aspect of our own consciousness. Just as every prophet represents an aspect of our own being, an aspect of something inside of us. So this story of Hashem, the Lord, speaking to Moshe, represents our own inner being speaking to another part of us whose duty it is to guide us out of slavery, to guide us out of suffering. Moses represents Tithereth, that mysterious sephira on the tree of life, which is precisely in the center of the tree, the half. If you divide the tree in halves, whether vertically or horizontally, the half is always Tifereth, the middle. This is Moses, symbolically speaking. Tifereth, in this sense, represents our human soul, our human consciousness, which must serve the Lord. And if Moses, our inner Moses, serves the Lord, he can receive the commands of God directly. This is why Hashem says, Speak ye unto the children of Israel, which are all the other parts of our consciousness, which are trapped in slavery. We know this is a fact, because we are trapped in suffering. We ourselves are trapped in slavery to Egypt, Mazarim, in bondage to our ego, to desire. And because of that slavery, we need our Moses to save us. At the same time, we have a longing to know God. Otherwise, we wouldn't study this information. All of us want to know, how can I perceive God? How can I see God? How can I hear the voice of God? How can I commune with my being? And we have that longing to know the answer is here in the ark. It's stated very clearly in the Bible, in the scripture. And there I will meet with thee and I will speak with thee. Thus, if we want to receive the commands of God, the guidance of God, we need to build an ark. But it isn't a boat. It is Aaron. It is a special kind of sanctuary. And it's related specifically with the heart. We know this is true because God says it in the scripture. Speak unto the children of Israel that they take for me an offering of every man whose heart maketh him willing. From every person whose heart inspires him to generosity. And when that occurs, when we make that offering from the heart, we offer to God the best that we have. God comes there and sanctifies that place. This is why this chapter in Genesis, or in Exodus, continues. From every person whose heart inspires him to generosity, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering that you shall take from them, gold, silver, copper, and goes on to name many items, which are all symbolic. And then says, and they shall make me a sanctuary, and I will dwell in their midst. So the creation of this sanctuary where God will come to dwell, to speak to us, to guide us, is related with the heart. This becomes more interesting when we understand that Aaron 
when it's discussed or spoken of, is actually described as Aron Koresh, or Kodesh, Aron Kadosh, which means the holy ark, or holy vessel, or holy sanctuary. And it's from Aron Kadosh that we find the word ark. Kadosh means holy or sacred. You see, when this Aron is made pure, it becomes Kadosh, holy. And then we can see Ar K. The word Ark is actually a contraction of Aron Kodesh or Aron Kadosh. Holy vessel, holy sanctuary. Thus, to make the ark, we have to make our own Aaron holy, pure. What this tells us is that we ourselves are the ark. You and me. We are the vessel that God wants to fill, but only if that sanctuary is made pure. And there's abundant information about this in the Bible. Firstly, we know that in Corinthians, Paul states explicitly, ye are God's building. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? That temple is the sanctuary, the temple of Solomon. And in the holiest region of that sanctuary is placed the Ark of the Covenant, the Aaron. And where is the holiest vessel within us where we long for God to dwell, but in our heart temple, in our very heart, our very essence, the very root of our soul is there. The heart is the region of Tiferet. The heart is related with Tiferet on the tree of life. And this is also related with Moses. This is why God is instructing Moses how to build the ark, the Aaron, because it is development related with Tiferet and the heart. We know further that the Aaron or ark is you and me because of the letters that spell Aaron. As I told you, the Bible doesn't say Ark. It says Aaron, which is spelled Aleph, Resh, Vav, Nun. When you understand the meanings of these letters, then you know immediately that this Aaron is pointing to us. That it indicates symbolically how the force of God, the spirit, the breath, descends into us to dwell. The first letter is Aleph, which is the trinity in its shape, two yods and above. That Aleph represents the air, the Ruach Elohim, that hovers over the waters of creation. It represents the most holy divine, who can descend in us through the Resh. The letter Resh represents our head, and through our head, we have the pineal and pituitary glands, and the three nervous systems emerge from here. And through those nervous systems emerge all the energies that we utilize to be alive. Those triple forces of God, the Trinity, descends through our three nervous systems, through the Resh. Through and down the spinal column, which is represented by the Vav, the third letter. And through the spine, those three energies manipulate and manage and empower our three nervous systems. But the ultimate synthesis of all of that ends in the letter Nun, the final letter of Aron. And the Nun always means the seed, the essence. And we know very well that everything that we are as a person 
is synthesized and condensed in our sexual seed. Everything that you are is encoded there. And the very power to create as a god is in the nun. But the nun is not explicitly or expressly related only to sex. Because it is also the very name of Noah. The nun, which resides in the heart. Noah enters the ark to be saved, remember? And that ark is related with the heart. By that process of Noah entering the heart to be saved, later emerges Moshe, Moses, so that that development can proceed. So the Nun is the beginning of the development of Moses, Moshe. So there's very deep meanings just in those four letters, which clearly point to us, to how we receive and utilize the force of energy that gives us life. High. That force comes from God. But unfortunately, we don't see God. Our own Aaron is dark. We don't see God. Most people don't even believe in God. Or if they do, they have contradictory ideas. Our vision our perception has become very limited, such that we only see the body, not the spirit or the soul. This is important because in the creation of the ark, the Aaron, God states quite explicitly that when the ark, the Aaron, is constructed according to his instructions, God will dwell there and speak to us speak to our own inner Moshe, or Moses, which is Tiferet, related to our heart. The way God does that is through Shekinah, the very essence of God, the energy, the force, the spirit. When the ark, the Aaron, is constructed in the right way, when our temple has been made pure, the Shekinah dwells there. And this is why in the ancient traditions it states that kept inside of the ark was not only the body of the law, which are the tablets of the written law, the second law, or in other words, Deuteronomy or the Ten Commandments, those tablets that Moses prepared. But also there is the soul of the law and the spirit of the law. These three items are first, the Kabbalah, this is the spirit of the law. The second is the oral tradition, or the Midrash or Talmud. And this is the soul of the law. And the third is the written law, which is the body of the law. These three are said to be kept inside the Aron. If we ourselves are the Aron, the Ark, then we need to understand that the Bible is not stored inside of our body. That's not the meaning. <clears throat> the meaning is that when our own Aron, our own Ark, has been sanctified and made into Aron Kadosh, a holy place, then we ourselves embody the teachings through our actions through how we behave, through what we do. We become the written law. Our behaviors are in accordance with the commandments that we receive from God. And secondly, we embody the oral tradition, the soul of the law, which is not something written, but spoken our words reflect the Shekinah, that which comes out of us, that which we say, that which we teach, reflects the Shekinah, the divine feminine aspect of God. 
And thirdly, our very spirit reflects God. This is intuitive. Intuitive action. If you recall in the Bible, it says later that due to their misbehaviors, the misbehaviors of the children of Israel, the soul and the spirit abandoned the Aaron. They left the ark. So the nation was left with only the written law. Only the literal meaning. And we see this is a fact on the face of the earth now. Humanity only sees the written words and takes them literally. No longer understands the soul of it or the spirit of it. They no longer intuit the real meaning because we've become spiritually blind. This is reflected in how we are as people. Many of us don't even believe in the soul or the spirit. We demand physical proof. And if we don't see it with our physical senses, we don't believe in it. Some of us may believe in the soul or believe in the spirit, but, but don't know the difference between them. We don't know that they are distinct. In fact, we have many contradictory ideas about the soul and spirit because we've never seen them. The reason is quite simple. It's because our own Aaron, our own ark, is in darkness. The Shekinah does not dwell there. If the Shekinah dwelled within our own ark, we would see it. We would know it. And we would have gnosis. Conscious knowledge. We would see and know and be able to intuitively understand the entirety of this. We can reach that if we follow the instructions that God provides. So the first step to make this Aaron holy, Kadosh, God says here very clearly it's through sacrifice. The scripture says, Speak unto the children of Israel that they take for me an offering of every man whose heart maketh him willing, ye shall take my offering. What is this offering? It is not something that we do because we are forced or because we feel that we have to. A true offering is given from generosity. Spontaneously. Sincerely. With genuine expression of love. This is the beginning of the creation of this holy sanctuary in our heart. In other words, if we're approaching our religion, whatever that religion may be, mechanically, because we have to, or we, because we're forced, we cannot create Aron in us. Because there is no sincerity. We're doing things literally, by rote, by repetition, this has no purpose. It benefits no one. Most of all, ourselves. In other words, we're only doing mechanical, literal actions of the body, repeating the written law, but not truly living it. For that written law to fully be alive, it has to be enlivened by the soul and spirit of the law which is intuitive action through the consciousness. Sincere, present, awake. We have our consciousness asleep. We exist in the fetid cage of our intellect, believing that this thought, idea, belief, or theory will save us. We fail to realize that only the spirit and soul can save us. And they are not intellectual. They are related with consciousness, not intellect. In other words, when we abandon the intellect and we call up the true, sincere essence of ourselves, 
to cry out to God, to offer our very selves to our own inner God, God responds. This is the only way. Through sincere action in the moment, being present, being alive, being, in other words. This is so fundamental that in in reality we could simply repeat that for the rest of the lecture. Because all the rest will happen naturally. All of the rest of the creation of the ark will occur spontaneously if we can just do this one thing, which is to activate the consciousness, which is related with the heart, nun, by means of which we open a direct connection to God, because the consciousness is part of God. We, unfortunately, are so asleep so habitual, so encaged in ideas and theories and beliefs and expectations and duties that we don't even realize what the consciousness is. We only see the body and have no clue about the soul or spirit. It's a sad state that we live within, and it's why we suffer. But if we can learn to activate our consciousness, to be present, to start sincerely manifesting a continual awareness of ourselves and God, this produces a fragrance in the heart, a consciousness, something that vibrates and lives in the heart. And God responds to that. Life changes. It truly changes. From that change, from that continual expression of the sincerity of our being, God responds. We start to receive those instructions of how to make our heart a fit temple. We start to see the garbage that is in our temple. If we don't make the sincere effort to be awake from moment to moment, we cannot see the true state of our mind. By mind, I'm indicating mind-heart, our essence, our soul, what we have of it. When we go along mechanically on autopilot from moment to moment, from day to day, we only see the projections of that mind. We see our desires, our fantasies, our ideas, our wishes, our hopes, our fears, but we don't see where those projections come from. We don't see why they are there. It's only when we make the effort to reverse that flow of conscious energy and to look back at ourselves instead of being fascinated with the images projected by our mind that we can then see That all of those images, those fears, those worries, those concerns, all those attachments, all those theories about religion or about life, are actually being produced by fear, by pride, by shame, by lust, and anger, and envy, and gluttony, and jealousy, and the list goes on. And all of that is garbage and filth that clutters the temple that our own inner God longs to inhabit, but cannot. God cannot mix with those impurities. God cannot mix with lust. If we have lust in ourselves, God cannot come there. Because God is God. God is pure. If you mix God with that impurity, God is no longer there. What is there? Filth. We don't like to see it. We don't like to admit it. We want to think of ourselves as pure and holy people who've been wronged and who've made mistakes maybe, but we don't like to admit that we ourselves are culpable for our pain. 
that we are the ones who created our own situation. We don't like to admit what the Bible says, which is that every man will receive according to his action. And that the Dharma says that we become according to what our mind does. We are what we are because of what we are. We are in our situation because of our actions. Simple cause and effect. We prefer to blame other things, other people, other circumstances. Our boss, our spouse, our friend, our parents. They're all to blame. We've just done our best to get along. This is a lie. It's a lie we tell ourselves in order to avoid the truth. The truth is, we are the ones who have driven Shekinah out of the temple of our heart. We are the ones who have driven out the Divine Mother, who have driven out God from the temple. Because we went into the temple and started committing crimes, and we continue to do it. That temple is our heart and mind. A simple example that we repeat all the time, which is incontestable, is when Jesus says, you have heard that you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, every time you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you have committed adultery with her. Thus, you are an adulterer. Thus, your temple is impure, and God cannot dwell there. We are all guilty. Not only of lust, but of murder, killing, because through our anger, we kill one another in our mind. In fact, we love violence so much that we indulge in it every day. Through the television shows that we watch, we become so fascinated with the images of violence and bloodshed because we like it. We like the taste of killing because our anger likes it. Our pride likes it. Our gluttony likes violence. This has nothing to do with God. So how can God dwell in a room within which we indulge in these filthy pleasures? We need to be sincere with ourselves and recognize our behaviors for what they are and change. If we really want to know what God actually is, we can. But we have to change. Simple. The instructions to build the ark come after this. If we make the sacrifice to change, to, to make our offerings to God from our heart, that sacrifice means instead of following the desires of the mind, instead of falling into the temptations of that impure spirit, Ra, pollution, we transform that anger into love. We offer that. That's an offering right there. The instant that we feel the pull to indulge in the lustful image, and we reject that and transform that impulse into chastity. That is an offering to God. Immediately. If we maintain consciousness of what we're doing. And that produces that fragrance in the heart. This is a great sacrifice to make. It's very difficult. Because we've become so submerged in impurities. Nonetheless, in the instructions in the Bible, it says, after listing all of the items of the offering, the Lord says, and they shall make me a sanctuary and I will dwell in their midst. So that action of transforming impressions from moment to moment begins to cleanse the environment of our heart and mind. And then God begins to dwell there. How do we know this? Because we're being conscious. The consciousness is the very power of God to act here and now. 
And if that consciousness is not present, God cannot be present. If that consciousness is present, that consciousness cannot participate in lust or anger or pride because those elements are the opposite. They are cages, traps, prisons for the spirit of God. So God will leave. Right after this in the Bible it says, they shall make an aron of acacia wood. In Hebrew it doesn't say acacia, it says the Hebrew word for this kind of wood. But this type of wood is very important and symbolic. In English it's spelled A-C-A-C-I-A. It's a very ancient, very important wood in Egypt. The most sacred. The reason is because in the myth of Osiris, when his twin brother, Sep, murders him, the body of Osiris is placed in a chest, an ark, on the river, just like Moses. That ark, that boat, arrives at the shore, and from that place springs up an acacia tree, which grows around the chest to protect it, to protect Osiris Christ. This is in the Egyptian mythology. That same tree is where the Roman centurions cut the crown of thorns for Jesus of Nazareth. So this acacia wood is deeply Christic, related with the death and resurrection of Christ, whether it's symbolized as Osiris or as Hiram Abif amongst the Masons, because when Hiram is murdered by his betrayer and buried, they place an acacia branch to mark the grave. In all these cases, this wood is, symbol, is, is a symbol of the power of sacrifice. You see, Christ always sacrifices himself for others. Osiris, Hiram, Jesus, all of them sacrificed themselves for others, which relates to acacia wood. And this is why the Bible says, after you make this sanctuary, this offering, and God can enter into the sanctuary, you have to build it with acacia wood. This very wood related with Christ and sacrifice. Deeply symbolic. And then God gives the measurements. It says in the Bible that God tells Moses, tell the people, the children of Israel, to build the Aaron at two and a half cubits in length, one and a half cubits in width, and one and a half cubits in depth. To explain that in its completion would take several hours. There is so much depth in those little numbers. <clears throat> so many meanings. The basic indication here, each of these numbers is a number and a half. Two and a half. One and a half. One and a half. Why? Because of Tiferet. The Akacha wood is the sacrifice, the power of Christ. The half of the tree of life is Tiferet. It's the half from the top to the bottom and the half from side to side. All of these measurements relate to Tiferet. And Tiferet, again, is related with Moses, who is receiving these instructions from God. In other words, these numbers are deeply meaningful in relation with how Moses develops himself, our inner Moses. But the full significance of it would be very complex to try to explain in the context of this lecture. I'm just giving you hints that you can use for meditation. After these measurements, God says, and you shall overlay it with pure gold from inside and from outside, you shall overlay it and you shall make upon it a golden crown all around. Gold 
is always used in temple interiors because it represents the power of the sun. Gold is a solar metal which relates with the pure spirit. It's considered precious because it has a relationship with the sun. And Tifereth is ruled by the sun and also by Venus. The sun is a representation of Christ. Once again, we have a repetition of Christic symbols, the gold. But gold only emerges when it's been purified of impurities through the process of alchemy. You see, alchemy is that ancient science to cleanse out impure metals. And those impure metals represent the ego. Lust and pride and envy and anger. And when all those are removed, what, what is left is the pure gold of the spirit. So our own Aron has to be covered completely with gold. And this points directly at the body of gold. The solar bodies, the wedding garment, the Tosoma Heliacon or the Merkaba. These are the bodies of gold represented in the lower portion of the tree of life, which are in themselves the very soul that we have to create. These are all symbolized in the structure of the ark, which is a box or a chest, a square. If we visualize a box, we see it's a conjunction of fours. And those fours, the four sides, four edges, four lines, rep relate to the cubic stone and to the, our, the structure of the four bodies below Tiferet. This is a deep symbol. The Bible continues and explains that you shall cast four golden rings and place them upon its four corners, two rings per side, as supports or as feet for this box. Four golden rings placed as feet. And through these golden rings shall be placed rods or staves of acacia wood, poles, in other words, that are also covered with gold. And those two rods shall never be removed from it because they are the very support and foundation of the ark itself, the Aron. We know in religious symbolism that the staff always relates to the spinal column. In all of the ancient traditions, the priest or Kohen carries a staff. And at the top of that staff is a pine cone, which symbolizes the pineal gland. The word pineal comes from pine. This is a symbol of where that force emerges or descends into the spine, which is the bav in Aron. The staff represents that. And you know that Moses and Aaron did many magical acts with a staff or rod. And so did the pharaohs. And so did the Greeks. It's true in every religion. So the staff represents the spine. But why is the Aron, our own ark, dependent upon two staves that are covered with gold. And those staves cannot be removed. And why the four rings? If you open your imagination and you recall times that you've entered a sacred sanctuary or temple, you may discover with astonishment that in order to enter there, 
you always pass through two columns, one on the right and one on the left. This is true of every temple, of every tradition, anywhere in the world. The two columns are always there. These two columns have a very deep significance because they represent the Elohim, God and Goddess, Shiva and Shakti, male, female, through which all creation occurs. The Elohim, who created man in their image, because the Bible says, let us create him in our image, male, female. The Elohim is the father mother. In Da'at, the tree of knowledge, which is where creation occurs. These two columns represent that. In order to enter into the sanctuary, to enter into the temple, we always have to pay respect to these two columns which have been called the one on the right, Jaquin, the white column, masculine, projective, the one on the left, Boaz, the dark column, receptive, the mother, father, mother, Jaquin, Boaz, El, Eloa, and in their combination is provided the support of the temple, the very edifice of the temple, which is in its synthesis, Elohim. So now we see three parts. Two columns and an edifice. This is how a temple is built in its most basic form. In Egypt, every temple has this, without exception. And Moses was raised as, as an Egyptian priest. When he wrote these instructions and prepared his doctrine, the entire thing is Egyptian. The Akacha wood, the columns, the temples, the Aron, everything. The two staves represent two spines. And if you look into Egyptian mysticism, you discover that the columns are called Jed. D J E D. And the hieroglyph for Jed is a column. But it's a column that has four indentations or four lines. And the column is related with our spine. It's a visual depiction of the spine. In fact, there are sculptures of Ta, the creator, with a spine in his hand. And there are many images of the gods and goddesses and pharaohs and initiates trying to raise a, a jed, a spine to be upright as a symbol of the process of initiation. That spine represents the staff of Aaron. The staff or rod that Moses placed in the ground and rose a serpent upon it in order to heal the Israelites. That spine is our own spinal column, the Vav, through which the Aleph descends through the Resh, the, pi the pineal gland, the pine cone, down the rod, the spine, in order to enliven our nun. These letters make Aron, Ark. The Ark itself depends upon the spine, but not one, two. But the word Aron only has one, Vav, one spine. The temple edifice cannot have one column. It must have two. It must have father, mother, priest and priestess, male and female, working in cooperation in accordance with divine law. In other words, God tells Moses very clearly, if you want to make an ark, an Aaron, you need two spinal columns that work together side by side. Two, not one. A single person cannot complete the ark. 
in order for these spinal columns to work in harmony with each other, they need to pass through the rings of gold. So what is that? This is also very beautiful. These golden rings are the letter Mem. And in Hebrew, the letter Mem looks like a ring or a circle. And there are two Mems, the open Mem and the closed Mem. When you put two Mems together and you put a man between them, a Yod, you spell Mayim, which means the waters, Eden. And we've discussed at length that the Mem is related to two spheres on the tree of life. The upper Mem is related with Da'at, the upper Eden. And the lower Mem is related with Yasod, our sexual organs, the foundation of life. In other words, when you look at the tree of life superimposed over our body, and you know that the rod is the spine, which is the central column of the tree, then you can see the two rings of gold, Da'at and Yasod. Do you see it? The spine is the central column, the mem in da'at, and a mem in yasod. That's one. And then you need another person, a male and a female, both with the spine, both with those rings of gold, da'at and yasod. Da'at is the tree of knowledge. Yasod is the lower Eden. Da'at is the Shamayim, the fiery waters, heaven. Yasod is the Mayim, the lower waters, Eden. Very deep significance in these few little words about four golden rings and two staves. But the whole doctrine of the mystery of the tree of knowledge is hidden there. Once this is complete, after the staves, the rods, are firmly within the two rings, each, then God says, and you shall place into the Aaron the testimony which I will give you. This is a significant clue. Once the two spinal columns are established in Da'at and Yasod, then the testimony of God is in the Aron. This is when the first law emerges. The real testimony. Not just the written law, but the soul and spirit of the law. God itself, the Shekinah, as testimony emerges. Conscious knowledge, in other words. Then the Bible explains how to make a cover for the Aron, to seal it. And this cover also has a deep significance and meaning. But of most importance is that on top of it are cherubim. The word cherubim is a word for a type of awakened or highly developed being. You might remember that when Adam and Eve were cast out of Eden, a cherubim was there to guard the way to the tree of life, who held a fiery, ever-turning sword. And this is not just accidental that it's described as a cherubim, because a cherubim is an awakened being who lives in Yasod, which is Eden, someone who has their consciousness at that level. According to Kabbalah, the awakened beings who live in Yasod are called Kerubim. But in esoteric Christianity, Kerubim are related with Chokmah, a very high sphere related with Christ. But these two are intimately related, so it makes sense. 
Nonetheless, on the cover for the Aron, the Ark, are cherubim depicted in gold. The curious thing is that if you don't know this teaching in depth and you read the passage in Exodus about this, you would assume that there are two cherubim on the cover for the Aron because it says, and you shall make two golden cherubim, you shall make them of hammered work from the two ends of the Aron cover. So most people think that the ark has two golden angels on the top. But actually, there are four. Two on each end. This is related with the Tetragrammaton, the holy name of God, and many other levels of significance. What's specifically important here is that the Aron cover goes on top of the Aron, the ark, and inside is placed the testimony. And then God says, And you shall place the Aron cover from above, and into the Aron you shall place the testimony which I will give you. I will arrange my meetings with you there. And I will speak with you from atop the Aron cover, from between the two cherubim that are upon the Aron of the testimony. So if we want to receive knowledge of God, commandments of God. We need to understand the significance for us. It's easy to get intellectually confused by these symbols. You have to listen to the intuitive, deeper, symbolic meaning. What this is telling us is something very sacred, which is hidden from those who have not been initiated in the old, old traditional mysteries. The, the traditional Kohen or priests always knew the true meaning here. And I'll prove it to you. Because in the Talmud, it's explained explicitly what these cherubim symbolize. In the Talmud, it says this. Rabbi Katina said, when the Israelites would ascend to the holy temple on the festival, the priest would roll up the curtain for them and display for them the cherubim who were joined together in an embrace. The priest would then tell them, Behold, the beloved feelings for you on the part of the omnipresent are like the beloved feelings of a male for a female. And Rabbi Bar Rav Shila explains that the cherubim appeared in the engravings as a man joined in an embrace with his female companion. If you've ever seen a tantric sculpture of Vajrasattva, Padmasambhava, even Buddha Shakyamuni or Adi Buddha, they're all represented as a male and female in sexual union and cast in gold. It's the same symbol that is on the ark. Cherubim in sexual union. Furthermore, in the Talmud, it says this. When the Gentiles entered the sanctuary, in other words, outsiders, entered the sanctuary, they saw the engravings of the cherubim joined together in an embrace. They took the engravings out to the marketplace and they said, should these Israelites be involved in such erotic matters. Immediately, the Romans debased the Israelites. In other words, the Romans cursed them and defaced the temple because they saw that the holiest of holies, the most sacred object in the temple, had a golden couple in the sexual union. This is documented in Scripture. The entire basis of Christianity and Judaism is based upon this. And yet it is forgotten. People don't want to see the actual roots. That sex is a part of creation. Sex is how God creates on all levels. But not animal sex. 
animal sex is only good for animals to create more animals. Angels create sexually, but angelically. Not with lust, and not with fornication, and not with adultery. Pure sexuality. This is the meaning of all the symbols of the Aron. On every level, every part of it points towards this, the most holy, sacred heart of Judaism and Christianity is a doctrine of sexuality. Pure sexuality. And this is why marriage is sacred. This is why fornication is forbidden. Adultery is forbidden. Because to make our own Aaron holy, we have to abandon those behaviors. We have to create a pure sanctuary for God to enter in and inhabit. Unfortunately, because we have abused our temple, we fell into temptation and ate the forbidden fruit and defiled the temple of God. We were cast out of Eden out of Yasod, forbidden access to the tree of knowledge in Ba'at. And we entered into suffering in the wilderness and came to know pain and death. The way back is guarded by a cherubim with a flaming sword, and that cherubim is on the Aron. The very entrance to Eden, the doorway, is sex. But we can only enter that doorway if the cherubim on our own Aaron allow us to enter. Because Eden is sacred. Eden is pure and holy. In other words, what we find inside of the ark is Eden itself. And that is in us. The entrance to Eden the entrance to paradise is through our own heart and mind when sexuality is used in a pure way so that these forces of the divine, the breath, the neshema, of the ruach Elohim, descends through our resh, down the vav, and into the nun, the seed. And we combine those male and female principles in purity and in that divine union we give birth to the soul this is why jesus says that you must be born again of the spirit and the water the water is the mayim that's the meaning of that hebrew word mayim means waters which relates with yasod the spirit is aleph it is also shin, the letter for fire. When that shin is connected with mayim, it spells shamayim, heaven. When that shin comes in between those four cherubim who sit on the cover of our own Aaron, remember those four cherubim represent the te tetragrammaton, shot he bav he, the holy name of God. When that shin of fire, Christ, descends into the midst of those four, that spells Yeshua, the Savior, Jesus, the Christ. It's very deep. But it's not just theoretical. This is not something just to contemplate. It is something to actualize. Whether we are a single person or married, there is work that we can do. The work begins through sacrifice. Sacrificing our psychological state. It's not through sacrificing physical things. God tells Moshe, Moses, to receive from the people their sacrifices. 
Moshe is the consciousness, willpower. Tiferet. We are here in our physical bodies, but we have a mind and a heart and impulses in our three brains. When we transform those to take the impurities and discard them and pull the impurities out, we do that through our own Moshe, Moses, who acts on our behalf to make those offerings to God in our heart. It doesn't matter if you're in a couple or a single person, you can do this. Simply being conscious of oneself and stopping our bad behaviors in the heart, in the mind, and in the body. That initiates a profound change in us psychologically and spiritually. And God responds. Furthermore, if we have become married or we're in a couple, this is even more vital. Because from moment to moment, we're receiving and transforming energy. If we're doing this in an impure way, we're creating even graver consequences because we're working with more forces. You see, a man and a woman who work together multiply the effects of their actions because the union of the two has the power of God, the power of creation. And through their actions singly or together, there's a greater impact. They share everything and multiply by their cooperation. This doesn't mean that if the man does something wrong, that the woman is immediately uh, guilty. But she does share in the result because they are one flesh. They do share the consequences to some degree. So those who are married have a much more great responsibility, not only to themselves, but to their spouse, to behave well, to behave in an upright way, and to never forget the presence of God. You see, in the, in the tradition, it's stated that even when the Israelites committed their crimes and defamed the temple, that the Shekinah began to abandon the Ark, the Aron, little by little. And what this represents is that if we have, let's say, for example, that we have developed our own Ark in the past, but we begin to behave badly, the Shekinah is there at first, but little by little, little by little withdraws. And most of us, the Shekinah is not there at all. That essence of God, the illuminating spirit that provides the wisdom and insight. Little by little, that essence, that Shekinah withdraws from the temple altogether. So that the person is left with nothing but the written law. And we see this in what we call fallen bodhisattvas. Fallen masters. People who speak the doctrine, who have the written word but the soul and spirit has abandoned them. The Shekinah is not there. And they may project themselves as priests or as masters, and they may be perceived as that, but the Shekinah is not there. The soul and the spirit is gone because their temple is impure. This is very common. The way to restore that is to restore the purity of the temple, which can only be accomplished by the cooperation of the two staves, two staves, the two spines. It's said that when the Spirit of God is present, that the Spirit speaks from between the cherubim. In other words, the Shekinah, which is the Divine Mother, communicates to us through our inner being. Through the Caribbean who's within us. And through our Moses who is within us. So these symbols represent levels upon levels in the tree of life. Much as the, the Aron itself symbolizes this. The, the four worlds can be seen in the very structure. Asya, Yatsira, Briya, and Atsiluth 
are represented here. But again, this is a, probably too much for today's lecture. In synthesis, whether we are a single person or in a couple, if we sincerely want to know God directly, it is up to us. It is not up to anyone else, and no one can bestow it upon you. The presence of God emerges in us because we have prepared a holy sanctuary in ourselves psychologically. This is the Aron. And this is done through the great sacrifice, through death. This is why the Akacha wood is the very heart of the entire structure. You remember the, the box and the, the rods are made with Akacha wood. This is the wood of the cross, the wood of the crown of thorns, the tree that protected the body of Osiris. Sacrifice, death, the death of the I, the death of the ego. And through that psychological death, which is a continuous effort from moment to moment, gradually the ark is constructed as a result of our efforts. Do you have any questions? Um, what is the harm suppressing those impurities can do as opposed to um, purging them from us? Like well, repression is mere avoidance. It doesn't solve anything. In fact, it can make things worse. As an example, if you get an illness and you uh, ignore it, you will get sicker and you will die. Simple. Ego is no different. The ego is a psychological illness, a disease. And it's very similar to cancer in this way. It's a kind of psychological disease that eats and consumes everything else until it kills the organism. And that death of the organism is called in the Bible the second death, which is when the entire psyche has been absorbed by the ego. There's nothing God can do. So God just puts us in the fires of the abyss in order to be cleansed of that impurity. It's the only answer. So repression leads to that, quite simply. If we avoid the facts of our own impurities, the end result will be the descent into hell. Because those impurities have to be cleansed. And God, out of compassion, provides that. It's painful. But it's up to us. Is there another question? This is a good question. Yeah, we know the term archangel, right? Which is a, a being who has created this ark. There are different levels of angels. There's the common angel, which is someone who's on their way to creating that. But the degree of archangel relates to a level of establishing that ark. And a cherubim is even higher. A cherubim has developed even more. This word ark like I told you in the beginning, is only related to Hebrew through the contraction of Aron Kadesh, or Kadosh. But if we look at it in Latin, it actually has a lot of importance. We get the word chest for our chest, the trunk of our body, from Arca, which is Latin. It means chest. And that right there tells you that our own Ark is here. The chest, where our heart is contained. And the heart is the arcana. The arcanum. The hidden thing. And I mean, the Greek mysteries and the Latin mysteries, the creative power where God creates is the archaeus. This is where creation occurs. In the ark. The archaeus. Which is where we get chaos. The archaeus comes from that. Moreover, when Noah built his ark, his boat, this ark landed on Ararat. And there, he built the first altar. The altar is related with the heart, the mountain. It's all symbolic. So all of these terms relate and point to that same ultimate root, which is within. So 
So the question is that if someone has already created the arc in the past, is it easier to recover it? And is this the same as the work of, of the Bodhisattva? Yes, it is the same work. The arc itself is the bodhicitta. It's the same thing. The word bodhicitta indicates a profound development of consciousness rooted in the power of sacrifice and compassion, the same as the arc, the aron, the arc. Bodhicitta, as well, is always centered in the ethereal body, in yasod. So they have the very same basis, aron and bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is Sanskrit. It's the basis of the Mahayana and Vajrayana traditions in the East, all of which is dependent upon the power of conscious love. And through that power, the soul is elaborated, and the bodies of the Buddha are created, or all the paramitas. That entire creation begins and ends in Yasod, Bodhicitta, Aron, the Ark. So they are the same. As to whether it's easier to do it once you have done it? No, it is not. It is easier in the sense that, for example, if you've already traveled to a given city, then you know the route. You have some familiarity with the path. The problem is that when someone has worked in this type of path before, but has failed, they acquire an enormous debt, a burden, which they then have to carry if they wish to return to the place that they once abandoned. This is not easy, and very few do it. It is relatively easy to reach a degree of liberation or enlightenment to enter into the beginning stages of the development of our own aron or ark. In other words, to establish oneself in nirvana or Eden, relatively speaking, is easy. Once you know the science. It's relatively easy to create the solar bodies. Many do it. Yet, if one fails, having done so, one acquires a huge karma because one becomes a fallen angel. Then one has betrayed God. One has assassinated one's own inner Buddha. One has betrayed all of the gods who helped you reach that stage. And along the way has committed many crimes in order to have fallen. So one has all of those debts to pay in order to recover one's place. This is why it's really absurd to hear people boasting of being fallen, of saying, oh, I was such and such great initiate in the past, but I fell. And they boast about it. It's absurd. They might as well boast of having been Hitler because they're boasting of betraying the gods. They are boasting of assassinating their own inner God. How arrogant, how ignorant, and yet people do it. The fallen one, the one who did it before, is cursed, cannot be trusted by anyone. And this is why Samael Ambior said, the fallen bodhisattvas are worse than demons. At least with demons, you know where they stand. A fallen bodhisattva, you do not. They've been to the light. They've been to the darkness. Then no longer you can tell which way they will go. They may flip from one side to the other. The really interesting thing is that they are the ones who can develop the most light. This is the great contradiction. It's the fallen bodhisattvas who return to the light, who become the greatest prophets. And this is why in all the religions we have sayings similar to, the greatest sinners become the greatest saints. And it's because they know the depths of pain. 
So one should not boast. Can you do it through prayer and observation? Prayer and observation of oneself are basic components of the work to create the Aron or Ark, but they are only a part of the work. Prayer is the natural extension or, or purpose of meditation, which is when we enter into a state of consciousness where we are attempting to commune with our innermost. This is real prayer, is a state of meditation, a state of communion. It is not a state of spacing out. It is a state of active, awake, very bright consciousness. And observation is a state that helps us achieve meditation. Without observation, without active consciousness, we cannot do it. But these two are incomplete if we don't also have two additional factors. Birth. Well, actually, we need the three complete factors, right? We need birth and death and sacrifice. Prayer and observation are good, but they don't include the three factors on their own. We need daily to be changing our behavior and working to establish the death of our impurities. This is a rigorous psychological work. It does not happen automatically or just because we happen to be a good person with good intentions. It happens as cause and effect. Simple, basic. You produce causes, you receive results. That's it. If you don't actively and consciously destroy an ego, that ego is not dead. Furthermore, birth. We have to be transmuting our energies, transforming our divine forces so that those can be utilized for the birth of our soul. Thirdly, sacrifice. We have to do good for others in any way and in every way that we can. It's only when these three, birth, death, and sacrifice, are in harmony in our moment-to-moment -moment and day-to-day -day lives that the ark can emerge. Stated another way, if you only meditate, you cannot do it. If you only transmute, you cannot do it. If you do a lot of sacrifice for others but don't transmute or meditate, you cannot do it. There are a lot of believers who love Gnosis or who love their religion but cannot create the ark because they do not harmonize these activities as conscious action. There are many who try to sacrifice, who transmute, who try to meditate, but they do it mechanically. Thus, they cannot create anything. You see, this work is very rigorous, very scientific, very demanding. We have to be extremely precise. You cannot assume that you're on your way to heaven. You have to experience it. If you do not experience it, you need to revise your practice. Simple. We hear from many students of this tradition. Some new, some have been 5, 10, 15, 20 years, who still say, how do I know where I am? How do I know what level I've reached? How do I know if I've killed an ego? These students think they already know how to do the practice, and yet they don't know where they are. This is a contradiction. If you practice in the right way, you will know where you are, and you will know the state of your consciousness. If you do not know the state of your consciousness, if you do not know if an ego is dying, if you do not know your degree of initiation, you need to revise your mind. And the vast majority of the time, the problem is one of two things. The person is either too intellectual or they're too lazy. One or the other, or both. Simple. So you can revise your own practice based on that. If you feel you're stuck, if you feel you don't know where you are, if you feel like you've been in this for a long time and nothing's happening, you're making something some kind of mistake somewhere. Something in your practice is not accurate. So you need to find an instructor who can help you. You need to appeal to God and practice harder. 
and pray and meditate and get the guidance you need. Another question. Oh, that's beautiful. So the question is, if the ark and the body is the temple of God, what does Jesus mean when he says, destroy it and I will rebuild it? This is because the entire construction of the ark is a symbol of our work to enter into the Christic path. The ark or the temple is not a literal thing. It's symbolic of the process of our soul. When Jesus says, build it, and I will destroy it, and I will raise it again. He's talking about death and resurrection. The Christic path. The highest path in which everything that we are, whether that temple is illuminated or perfect or not, must die. But in order for us to reach that Christic mystery of resurrection... The ark that we create, the soul, the Merkaba, must die. The very process of initiation is a process of a spiritual birth. But the resurrection cannot happen if there's no death. How can you resurrect if you have not died? In order to be born again, in order to resurrect, you have to die. All of that impurity has to die. Furthermore, the very soul itself passes through a symbolic death, an initiatic death, a spiritual death, which is painful but beautiful. Because after that emerges that divine butterfly, the soul itself, the perfected soul, the Vajrasattva, the most divine. Is there another question? Okay. Thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.